Good morning, family of God. It's great to be here with you again today, and I'm looking forward to bringing you our second installment of our new series, The Kingdom. Today's message is called Unshakable. Wouldn't you love to be unshakable? Well, you can be because the kingdom of God is unshakable. And if you're in the kingdom of God, God's intention is for you to also be unshakable. You know, in 2017, there was a 7.1 magnitude earthquake in Mexico City. And this is a very interesting observation. There were literally 50 story buildings that stood, did not crumble, were not affected by the earthquake. But then there were two story houses that just crumbled flat. And you're like, well, what was the difference? Well, uh, Mexico City was built on top of uh, ancient lakes and waterways. And so the soil underneath uh, different buildings and different structures were uh, soft and, and pliable and vulnerable. And so what they did after the 1985 earthquake, which was devastating, they had new uh, building codes. And so when you build a building, you have to do it according to code. And so they are earthquake proof. Well, some of the buildings that collapsed in the um, second earthquake did not have those building codes because here's what happens is that there are people who would build their own homes or they would build extensions on their homes, but they wouldn't do it to code. And so with the new code, you, instead of doing pillars, you do walls and the walls are built in such a way that they can handle shockwaves going up and down them, but it doesn't affect the building. But if you're just building your own and you don't do it to code and you just do these pillars, you know, well, when the shock waves hit, poof, those things just explode and your house collapses. We learned in our last series, uh, just called Jesus, that when you and I build our lives on the teachings of Christ, we're building them on a firm foundation. And when the storms hit, your house does not collapse. Well, in the same way, in this new series, The Kingdom, we're talking about the internal structures of your life. We're talking about your soul realm. We're talking about your heart. We're talking about your thought life, the internal structures of your house need to be built with the right materials, which are the nature of God's kingdom, because God's kingdom is unshakable. So today I want to talk to you about the unshakable material in the kingdom of God. Let's build our lives on that, and we will not shake with the rest of the world. All right, you ready? I'm going to give you some attributes. There's going to be more, I'm sure, but here's just some attributes that we can uh, cleave to that will help us be unshakable. The first one is the sovereignty of God. You know, in the book of Daniel, written 300 years before Christ came, this is amazing. I mean, if, if you want to have faith in Christ, you want to have faith in the Word of God, just read prophecies in the Bible. Things that the Holy Spirit had men and women prophesy into the future, things that were going to happen, that came to pass. They're all over the Bible. That alone would convince you that the Word of God is the Word of God. Here's one of them. 300 years before Christ came, Daniel, who was a, a Jewish slave in the Babylon kingdom, Babylonian kingdom, the most powerful empire in the world at that time, and the king's name was Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. It shook him to the core. The dream was of a huge statue. It had a head of gold. It had a chest of silver. It had a waist of bronze. It had legs of iron, and it had feet mixed with iron and clay. But then there was this little rock that, that was uh, cut out of the mountain, not using hands. And it rolled down the mountain, bam, and it hit those feet. And it just crumbled that statue. And the wind went, and it blew it all away. But that little stone became a massive rock the size of a mountain that filled the entire earth. Well, the king was wondering, what is this? And so Daniel prayed, and God gave him the interpretation of the dream. And Daniel talked about uh, four kingdoms that were going to come after Babylon. And so when we look back now, our vantage point, we look back in world history, we see very clear what those kingdoms were. The head of gold was the kingdom of Babylon. The next kingdom that was a, um, a kingdom of a silver chest was the Medo-Persian Empire that overthrew the Babylonian Empire. And then the, uh, the, the iron legs was the Grecian Empire that overthrew the Medo-Persian Empire. And then the feet of clay and iron was the Roman Empire, which overthrew the Greece, uh, uh, Grecian Empire. And that is the time when Jesus was born. <laughs> That's the rock. Jesus call, is called the rock. He called himself the rock. 
that rock struck the feet of the Roman Empire. And Jesus' kingdom, from the time he rose from the dead, has been filling the earth ever since. This is the sovereignty of God. God's kingdom will never be overthrown like the kingdoms of man. I love what uh, Charles Spurgeon said. Charles Spurgeon uh, is a, uh, was considered the prince of preachers, 19th century pastor. And this is what he wrote about the sovereignty of God. He said, glory be to God. Our kingdom cannot be moved. Our kingdom. I love that he called it our kingdom because we learned last Sunday, God loves to give you and I, his children, the kingdom. He says, our kingdom cannot be moved. Not even dynamite can touch our dominion. No power in the world, no power in hell can shake the kingdom which the Lord has given to his saints. With Jesus as our our monarch, we fear no revolution and no anarchy for the Lord has established the kingdom upon a rock and it cannot be moved or removed. Charles Spurgeon. The book of uh, Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews writes, Uh, something profound about what is going to happen in the end times as God shakes not just the earth, but the heavens. And I want to read this to you. Follow along. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, verse 23 through 29, he says this. And as members of the church of the firstborn. Now, the firstborn is talking about Jesus, but it doesn't mean he was born first because Jesus is eternal. It means that he has the preeminence. That's what that word firstborn there means. As members of the church of the firstborn, All our names have been legally registered as citizens of heaven. Now, you know, there's this big push for a census, right, for the United States. Well, guess what? Heaven has a census, too. And heaven is very clear who is living on earth that are citizens of heaven. Everyone who's given their life to the firstborn, Christ himself, the king of the kingdom, is a citizen of heaven. We're just temporarily living on the earth. But heaven has a registry, and it has your name in it if you've given your life to the king. And we have come before God who judges all. And he who lives among the spirits of the righteous who have been made perfect in his eyes. And we have come to Jesus who established a new covenant with his blood sprinkled upon the mercy seat. Now listen to this. I want you to catch this. This isn't the main message, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull this little scripture out. I wanna talk about it for a second. Jesus' blood continues to speak from heaven forgiveness, which is a better message than Abel's blood that cries out from the earth, justice. You see, Cain killed his brother Abel. And ever since that time, Abel's blood has been crying out from the earth, justice, really, vengeance. But Jesus's blood, when he shed his blood, it says he went into heavens and he sprinkled all the heavenly utensils up in the temple of God in heaven. He he sprinkled his blood everywhere because Adam's sin reached all the way up to the throne of God because that was where Adam's authority uh, extended to. And so Jesus had to cleanse all the heavenly utensils with his blood. Now from that place, from heaven, heaven is speaking to the earth, forgive, forgive, forgive. But earthly justice, when we are treated unjustly, we cry out, vengeance! And that's what's happening right now. And you see the product of it, don't you? You see the destruction. Some of you right now need to forgive. Don't cry out for justice and take vengeance and revenge in your own hands. God says, vengeance is mine, I'll repay. You don't know how to do it without destroying yourself and everybody else around you. So forgiveness, the Bible says, the better message than vengeance and justice. And then he goes on to say, make very sure that you never refuse to listen to God when he speaks. For the God who spoke on earth from Sinai, that's when God spoke from the mountain, Mount Sinai, when, when Moses was, had the Ten Commandments up on the mountain. And the mountain shook and there was lightning and there was fire and God was speaking and the people freaked out because they didn't have a heart for God. They were afraid of him, so they ran from him and they didn't obey him and they died in the desert. So he says, When God spoke from the earth in Sinai, it's the same God who now speaks from heaven. Those who heard him speak, his living word on earth found nowhere to hide. So what chance is there for us to escape if we turn our backs on God and refuse to hear his warnings as he speaks from heaven? Now you might be saying, oh my gosh, what are you talking about? Should I be afraid of God? No, I want to give you context here. What was happening here was there were Jews who had become Christians, but Christianity was under severe persecution. 
So these, these newborn Christians were tempted to go back into a more socially acceptable religion, which was Judaism, because Christianity was not popular and, and Christians are being persecuted. And, and the writer of Hebrews is saying, look, just like in the Old Testament, when God was calling them into a relationship, but they fled from him, there was nowhere to go for salvation. He said, in the same way, God is speaking from heaven to you right now. And if you turn back from Christianity, back into Judaism and animal sacrifice, which cannot forgive your sin, there is no salvation for you. That's what he was talking about. He was talking to those who had turned, who were tempted to turn from God. So he says this, the earth was rocked at the sound of his voice from the mountain, but now he has promised once and for all, I will not only shake the systems of the world, which is happening right now. The systems of the world are being shaken. That's what the scripture says right here. Once and for all, I will not only shake the systems of the world, but also the unseen powers in the heavenly realm. The first time God shook the earth, this time he's going to shake the heavens and the earth. Now this phrase, once and for all, clearly indicates the final removal of things that are shaking. That is the old order. So only what is unshakable will remain. Sometimes God will shake your life, but it's a good thing because the things that are not of him, the things we won't let go of that are destroying us are things that are not useful for this season. Maybe they were for the last season and God's brought you into a new place. He shakes relationships. He, he shakes occupations. He shakes ministries. He shakes us and everything that's not of him falls away. Everything he's built in you remains. So it's a good thing when we're shaken. He says, this time I'm going to shake and the things that are unshakable will remain. Since we are receiving our rights to an unshakable kingdom, there it is. We should be extremely thankful and offer God the purest worship that delights his heart as we lay down our lives in absolute surrender, filled with awe for our God is a holy devouring fire. Now, Again, that last phrase is not to you if you're a believer. God is a holy devouring fire in judgment for those who have not come to Christ and are uh, in him and in his kingdom and their sins are forgiven. There's a day when God's coming again and he's going to shake the heavens and the earth and it's all over at that point. So he's saying, come to Christ and you'll be part of an unshakable kingdom. The church is unshakable and unbreakable. Whenever the church is persecuted, it just spreads and grows. The church was persecuted in Jerusalem and it spread all the way throughout the rest of the world. Jesus is building his church and the powers of hell can't stop it. Never has been able to and it never will because Jesus is king is eternal. The second attribute of the kingdom of God that you and I must build our lives on so we can uh, still be standing after earthquakes and storms hit our lives is God's love. First is God's sovereignty. Secondly is God's love. It doesn't matter what you to, do to God. It doesn't matter what you say to him. It doesn't matter how far and fast you run from him. His love for you is unshakable. You know, I mean, you think about, it's also unreasonable and irrational. I mean, he just loves you. Jesus painted the worst sinful picture that a Jewish mind could ever come up with. You see it in the prodigal, the story of the prodigal son in the Bible, in Luke chapter 15. And Jesus paints this horrendous picture of this young Jewish son who should have been cut off from the family forever. Then he paints this beautiful picture of the unshakable love and mercy and compassion of the father and how he welcomes his son back home when he didn't deserve it and just reinstated him as a son without even asking him any questions. Just like Jesus did with Peter when Peter denied Christ. And when Peter wept and came home, Jesus didn't even talk to him about his sin. He just cooked him breakfast and said, do you love me? All right, let's go. Jesus says the same thing to you this morning. God's love for you is unshakable. It doesn't matter what the devil's been telling you, like God couldn't take you back now. You're on plan B. You're such a loser. You're a hypocrite. Jesus would never say those things to you. He died for you. He loves you. His love for you is unshakable. 
Look what this says in the book of Romans. It says this in Romans chapter 8, verse 35 through 39. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? Many times when you go through trials and tribulations and you wonder where God is, you've been crying out to God and he doesn't seem to be answered, you wonder if he loves you. Right here he's saying, these things don't prove that God doesn't love us. As the scripture says, for your sake, we are killed every, we're killed every day. We're being slaughtered like sheep. They were under persecution, but they didn't doubt God's love because some of them were being martyred for, for their faith in Christ. He goes on to say, no, 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 no. Despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I am convinced, he says, that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor fears for today or worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. Isn't that a great scripture? No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. And then 1 John 4, 18 says, there is no fear in love. A perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But the one who fears God inordinately shows that he simply has not fully experienced his perfect love. And by the way, this same unshakable, unending, eternal, supernatural agape love that God has for you and for me is the same love that we're supposed to love one another with. And that's what makes the church unshakable and unstoppable. When we love one another with the same love that Jesus loved us with, which is, our, which is his commandment, he says, when the church, when you guys love each other like that, the way I love you, that's when the world will know, I am Jesus and you're my people. The third attribute that we must build our lives on so that we are able to stand when the earth is shaken, like it's shaking right now, is God's hope. Do you know that hope is one of God's names? Look at this. In the book of Romans chapter 15, it says, Now may the God of hope, whoo, come on, when there is no hope in the natural, for a citizen of the kingdom of God, there's always hope. Why? Because we serve the God of hope. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope, not just have hope, abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes when you, you some, man, there are times where we are just hopeless in the natural. There is no hope. Like Abraham, supposed to have a child, you know, no hope. He, he, his body couldn't produce a child anymore if you know what I mean. And Sarah could not produce a child. And there was no hope in the natural. Zero. Medically, no hope. And yet, it says that Abraham hoped against all hope. Where did he get that hope? From the word of God. God promised him a child. God wouldn't promise you something if it wasn't needed. See, God's promises are supernatural. Why would he promise you something that you could get on your own? He makes promises because there are times in your life where there's going to be no way out, no way through, no way out or under, no hope, no help, no way. That's what the promises of God are for. And then he comes through for you. Look at this scripture says in the book of Hebrews. This is amazing scripture. Hebrews 6, 19 and 20. This hope that I was just talking to you about, we have as an anchor of the soul both sure and steadfast. I think about a story of a young man, a young a son, a true story, and he had really blown it. He had dug his own hole. He had made some dumb decisions, and his car was totaled, and he couldn't get to work, and he couldn't get to school, and he had no money. He had no hope. There, there was nowhere to turn. He didn't know what to do. And uh, he had a strained relationship with his dad, but, you know, he told his dad what was happening. And the dad thought, you know, you know, I, I've helped him out so many times and he keeps making the same mistakes and keeps getting himself in a jam. But what do you do, you know? And so this dad just decided, 
he needs to have compassion on his son. And so he went to his son and said, I'm going to give you my car. And uh, I'll just get another one because you, there's nowhere for you to go. And the, b- before the dad could finish his, his statement, the son threw his arms around his neck and just squeezed his neck. And he said this, he said, you just saved my life. And when I heard that story, I thought, that's exactly what it's like when the God of hope comes through for you. You just, if you could see him physically, you would throw your arms around his neck and say, you just saved my life. That's who our God is, the God of hope. Now, the rest of the scripture I just read, I'm going to read it to you. Takes us into the next point, the next attribute that you want to have, the internal walls of your soul and your mind and your life so that you can be sustained when the world is shaken, you don't have to shake. And this is what it says. I'm going to read the scripture over again, but the second half of it leads us into the next part. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, which enters the presence behind the veil where our forerunner has entered for us, Jesus, having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, what does that mean that this hope has entered the presence behind the veil? What that means is because Jesus, who is our hope, rose from the dead, And when he rose from the dead, that curtain in the temple where the high priest alone was able to go into the presence of God and all the other people had to stay out from that inner sanctuary, only the high priest could go. When Jesus rose from the dead, that 60 foot high curtain, six inches thick, ripped right down the middle from the top to the bottom, ripped open. And that was Jesus saying, anybody that wants to come into the presence of God now, you can come through me. I'm the curtain now, and I have made this way available for you. And so that's our hope. So you see, this hope that is the anchor of our souls, you can take that hope when you are desperate and there's no way out and go straight to the throne of God in the name of Jesus. That hope takes you right into his presence, and you have protection there. It goes behind the veil. You know, I was thinking last Saturday night at our Saturday night service, there was a guest there, and uh I was uh, talking to the dad and he wanted to introduce me to his little son. He was probably like maybe three years old and the son saw me. I don't know, stranger danger or something, scary pastor man. And so the little boy ran behind his dad and hugged on to his thighs. He looked at me from behind, you know, and I, and that's just, this is a great picture of this. He was confident that he could run behind his dad and be safe in his dad's presence. And when he was behind his dad, he was confident enough to stick to stick his head around and look right at me as long as he was behind his dad in the presence of his father. And that brings up the next attribute that is unshakable in the kingdom, and that is the presence of God. The current season we live in right now and the way that our world is being shaken, the world systems, we are learning once again that we cannot trust in the kingdoms of this world and the people of this world. We are fickle. We're all fickle. We're all transitory. We're all, we're all mixed in our motives. We're, we're cracked in our character, but not Jesus. Jesus is unshakable, and his presence in our lives is unshakable. This is why we worship so much. Our worship, when we sing to the Lord, we open our hearts, his presence comes. That's why it says that his presence, the enemy falls back and it fills our hearts with joy and it makes you solid when you worship him. It makes you solid on the inside. Look at this great scripture about the presence of God. How great is your goodness that you have stored up for those who fear you? Did you know that? That God stores up goodness for you? Stores up goodness for you. How great is your goodness that you store up for those who fear you, that you have given to those who trust you. You do this for all to see. Watch this. You protect them by your presence from what people plan against them. You shelter them from evil words. That's Psalm 31, 19 and 20. You know, I think about the story of a missionary uh, that I heard who was back in the... uh, back in the the jungles in Africa, and this warring tribe told them, told this missionary and his team, we're coming back tomorrow and we're going to kill you. And so the missionary did not know what to do. He went into his hut, 
knelt down and prayed for God's protection. And he stood out front of his hut. Where are you going to go? What are you going to do? And he stood out there with his team. And this warring tribe came to kill them. And they came up to them and they stopped and they froze. And they just stared at the man. And then they all turned around and ran away. I mean, could you imagine? And so the next day, the warring tribe sent a messenger and said, the chief wants to know, who were those huge men with swords that were with you last night? <laughs> yeah, well, that would be the angels. They travel with me where I go. You have angels too. Did you know that? They are part of the presence of God in your life. The book of Hebrews says, when you become a believer, a follower of Jesus, an angel or more, depending on how much trouble you are, are assigned to you to be with you for the rest of your life, to protect you. Isn't that a great scripture? That you protect them by your presence. The last two attributes, God's peace. These are the unshakable things in the kingdom of God. And as you and I cleave to these things, they become your and my unshakable attributes that will enable us to be unshakable when the world is shaking. God's peace. Look what Jesus says in John 14. I am leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. Can't you use that right now? Peace of mind and heart. Look what Jesus says to you today. I'm leaving you a gift, peace of mind and heart. Now watch this. And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot Give. You see, we're talking about two different kingdoms. This peace comes from the kingdom of Jesus, not from the kingdom of the world. We all want more peace. Well, the kingdom of Jesus has a peace that is unshakable, unchangeable, and unending. And one of his names is the Prince of Peace. He goes on to say, so don't be troubled or afraid. This is a great psalm, psalm uh, scripture, Psalm 55, 22. Now, this one will hit all of us. Cast your cares on the Lord and he will sustain you. Watch this. He will never let the righteous be shaken. Well, what does that mean? Well, look, he says, cast your cares on the Lord. That word means burden. So like this right here. <laughs> the sucker's heavy. And I know who owns it. So one of the sound guys, sorry. But this thing right here, this is, this is a burden. Like, could you imagine if you had to live life with this burden? Like, this is what you do. You wake up with it. You drink your coffee with it. You drive in the car with it. You go to work with it. Ugh. You go to parties with it. Oh, my gosh. Could you imagine? And this makes you unstable, shakable. Like, if you're having to deal with trials and tribulations and, and you got to carry this burden, some of you, your burden right here in your soul that makes you vulnerable when shock waves hit your life is unforgiveness. Some of you are carrying a major weight of unforgiveness in your soul. You cannot live like that. Resentment, anger. Some of you, it's financial burden. Some of you, it's a child that's run, run away from the Lord and it just breaks your heart. You live with this burden. It's just a weight. Some of you, it's your marriage. You can't change her. You can't change him. You can't even change yourself. And you're, Here's the burden you're living with, the burden of guilt and shame. You know what the scripture says to do with this burden so you can be unshakable? It says, cast your cares. It literally means that word to cast means to throw. <laughs> this is what the Lord wants you to do. Throw it ah, and just get rid of it. That is... <laughs> This, what the Lord wants you to do is throw that burden on him. Sound guys are freaking out right now, but it's fine because I threw him into the hands of the Lord. And that's the point. You say, well, wait a minute. That seems irresponsible. Who's going to take care of my burden if I don't? That's my point. God is faithful. And that leads us to the last point, the last attribute that you and I need to allow to fill up our hearts and our minds so we're unshakable. And that's God's faithfulness. We all blow it. Over and over again, we blow it. You sin and you sin again and you repent 
You have strongholds and struggles. We all do. That doesn't mean you're a hypocrite. That means you're a follower of Jesus and you're trying with the rest of us and you're depending on the Lord. But see, this is the thing. The longer you walk with him, the stronger you get because his holiness is being absorbed into your system, into the walls of your soul, into your mind, and you're being changed day by day. The Bible very clearly says in Philippians 1, 6, he that began a good work, a construction work. You're, you're, you're a work uh, under, under construction, a work in progress. You know, there's signs all around your life saying under construction, under construction, right? He that began a good work in you is going to continue it until the King Jesus comes back. He's never going to give up on you, ever. So don't give up on yourself and don't give up on him. It's his faithfulness to us that causes us to be faithful to him. He's never going to stop being faithful. He's not going to stop being faithful for you. You know why? Look at this. 2 Timothy 2.13. If we are faithless, which many of us are sometimes, he remains faithful. Why? He cannot deny himself. That's what the scripture says. He can't change his nature. He is faithful. So how should we respond to these things as we close? How should we respond to the fact that we are receiving this unshakable kingdom? I'm going to read the last sentence of the opening scripture. And it gives us three things we can do uh, to respond to the reality that as citizens of heaven on earth, we have received an unshakable kingdom. Look what he says. We read this earlier. This is the last part of it. Since we are receiving, not achieving, receiving. You just receive it. You know, Salvation is a free gift. It's grace. Since we are receiving our rights to an unshakable kingdom, it's right there. We should be, one, extremely thankful. Two, offer God the purest worship that delights his heart as we lay down our lives, number three, in absolute surrender, filled with all. So number one, how do we respond to the fact that we're receiving this unshakable kingdom? Thankfulness. Thankfulness will keep you connected to the goodness of God. That's why he says, come into my gates with thanksgiving. That's the way you start your prayer time. That's the way you start your worship. That's how you engage God. You don't, the first thing you come to God, you don't start confessing your sins. You don't find that in the Bible. The first thing you do when you come to God is begin thanking him for who he is. And to remind you, that's right. He's a forgiver. Then you can tell him, hey, I need forgiveness. But you've already connected to his goodness. <laughs> Thankfulness keeps you connected to the goodness of God. That's what he says. How should we respond? Extremely thankful. Secondly, is worshipful. When you and I see God for who he is, unshakable, and that he's invited us into his unshakable kingdom and that we don't deserve it, but we get it all, it makes you worship. You know, Daniel was told to bow down and worship the government and he would not do it. And so they threw him into a fiery furnace. They persecuted him. He said, I, I'm only going to worship God. I'm not worshiping the government. The government is not my source. My God is. And they did not like that answer. And they threw him into a fiery furnace with his buddies, but they didn't burn up. Because Jesus went in there with them and got them out and they didn't even smell like smoke. Same thing will happen with you and me. Satan tried to tempt Jesus and said, if you just worship me, just bow down, do one little bow down, compromise. And I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. And Jesus said, no. The word of God says to worship God and him only shall you serve. Don't bow down to the world. Don't look to the government as your source. God is your source. Worship Him. And thirdly, He says to surrender. And that's your faithfulness. Complete surrender. All in. Peter caved when he was a young man, when he denied Jesus. And uh, he said, I don't even know Him. I don't even know this Jesus you're talking about. He caved. He crumbled. A seismic earthquake of persecution hit Peter's life. And he crumbled because Peter did not build his life on the code of the kingdom. God's presence, God's sovereignty, God's hope, God's love, God's peace, God's presence, God's faithfulness. Peter built it on his own human capability and zeal and strength and his own wisdom. And it crumbled 
and the pressure came. But you know what? Over the years, when he walked with Jesus, the attributes of the divine nature were built into Peter. And by the end of his life, nothing could shake him. And, and they killed him. But he said, you know what? Before you crucify me, do it upside down because I don't deserve to be crucified the way my king was. That's unshakable. And now he's in heaven with Jesus, sitting in honor because of his faithfulness. What attributes of God's nature do you need more of in your life? Is it an understanding of God's sovereignty that he's in control not, not the Democrats, not the Republicans, not the independents, not the people that are giving all the money into the campaigns and all that. They're not in control. They're not sovereign. God is sovereign. God's kingdom is the only kingdom that's sovereign and unshakable. All, their, all of the kingdoms come and go. Maybe you need more revelation on that, or maybe you need a greater experience of God's love. That revelation alone will make you unshakable. God loves you. Maybe you need more of God's peace, Maybe you need more of God's hope, God's presence, and understanding of God's faithfulness to you. I want to ask you to close with me. Just close your eyes and put your hand in your heart if you'll do that with me right now. And uh, ask the Lord this question. Say, Jesus, what can I change in my life so that I can get in touch with more of your unshakable attributes. I'm going to ask you to ask him that again, and then just listen to what he might say to you, or a thought may come into your mind. Say, Jesus, what can I change in my life so that I can experience more of your unchangeable attributes? Okay, family of God, now look at me. Jesus, his goal for you is for you to be as unshakable as he is. So whatever he told you to do right there, whatever came to your mind, obey that, and you're going to become more unshakable than ever before. Now, if you've never given your life to Jesus, you're not in the kingdom of God yet. You're not a citizen. You can be. All you have to do is ask him in. I did that when I was 19 years old. I said, Jesus, I don't know if you're real or not, but if you are, I'm asking you into my life. And he came in. He, he's not going to half step. He wants you. He loves you. Come just as you are. Don't try to clean yourself up first. Don't think that you're unworthy because guess what? You are. We all are. It's a free gift. Just come. Now, if you ask Jesus into your life, if you'll please make a comment down below and just say, gave my life to Jesus today and I or someone will reach out to you and, and uh, we'll help you take the next step. But thank you for listening today. Share this with somebody. Somebody needs to hear this message. All right, God bless you. Josh is gonna come, closes in worship, and then uh, I'll see you next Sunday. <laughs>